people. That's that's the motto for over here. I don't take any shorts. I make every day a great one. I am so excited because when I posted that I was going to be on with you, a lot of people did it right on my page, but I realized that credit is really a personal thing, right? So I got a ton of DMs with right. a ton of questions. Yeah, that's that's pretty pretty standard. Like you said, people people treat their credit like um, as they should. You know, like it's like a kind of like a skeleton. You know what I mean? And even when I'm talking to people about their credit, uh, they you can just feel the embarrassment. A lot of times, you know, they're like, you know, I'm embarrassed. Don't don't look at it. Don't faint when you take a look at it. And what I tell people, I and mean, I'm dealing with a lot of affluent individuals, right? And sometimes people equate success and credit in the same category. And they think that if you're successful, that means that you have excellent credit. I'm telling people, listen, I know a lot of people who make a lot of money who just have bad choices because having uh, having bad credit is really just about choices. Right. It's not about who you are as a person or your your necessarily your morals or ethics. I mean, look at what happened just a few years back. The whole country got humbled. Look, right? my credit is stellar now, right? But in my 20s, in my late 20s, my early 30s, I had a whole like 320 at one point, And then I was excited when I got it up to a 580. Right. I'm at a 720 now. I would like to reach that 800s. But it took me till I was 48 to be like credibly responsible because I just didn't know any better. First of all, you don't have to ski past 48. Like you look 48. That's dope because you don't look that. <laughs> so congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> second of all, as far as the um, 720, just keep in mind, anything above a 720 is really bragging rights at that point. You know what I mean? It's really just for bragging rights. Uh, 720 is going to get you as much access as 800 for the most part. You know what I mean? So if you had a 720, you just maintain that if you're, you're going to do Well, I did that because a couple of years ago, I wanted to purchase a home. And mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure I got the best interest rate I could. And I got a 2.5% interest rate. So I was totally happy with that. Um, right, that, that was a purchasing goal. And then I do real estate. So I wanted to make sure that my credit was good for that. But it was a feat. Um, but it I is. want to help all these other people, but I want to get to know a little bit about you, Mr. Jones. I appreciate that. <laughs> what would you like to know? Uh, so the first question actually came from my nine-year-old, and she wanted to know what made you get interested in repairing credit for people. Great question. So it started with, um, you know, when I first met my wife at the time, I was actually, you know, a a street hustler. You know what I mean, I used to sell everything you could think of, uh, and I uh, did that for a few years. And then I went to prison. And when I came home, I, you know, I realized that you know, by the grace of God, I had a, another opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I had I didn't have any credit. I didn't really know what credit was at the time. I, my wife, or well, then girlfriend, when I became my wife, was um, said she was tired of rent. She didn't want to rent anymore, oh. and then she wanted to become a homeowner. And me being, you know, still kind of in that life, I'm like, you know, whatever, it don't matter. You know, we can rent, buy, it's all good. As long as it's a nice crispy crib, I'm cool with that. She's like, no, I want to become a homeowner. And so she started um, looking at her report and realizing that there were some things she wanted to get done. So she actually took, you know, two years of started doing the research and started really becoming a kind of a student of credit. And uh, I just watched kind of in front of sidelines because again I wasn't still I was still kind of just getting back in the mode of things. But I watched a single mom go from having, you know, low credit score to doing literally everything step by step to having you know, over a seven hundred credit score and again us being able to find and buy our home. And that just fascinated me. And so fast forward, uh I've always been an entrepreneur, you know, when I when I came home I, I had a few jobs because it was mandated and I wanted to be a good provider for my family and whatnot. But I realized that entrepreneurship has always been something that I thrive on. You know what I mean? So um, I started looking at what is a great need out here. And uh, I partnered at the time with a platform uh, that offered these services. My wife and I, we, we worked together. She still has her, her own business as well, doing the same thing. And uh, we were able to be, a, in our state, we were able to be the first six-figure earners in that platform, helping people uh, with credit. And so we got really excited. We realized there's so many people out here, like to your point, that just don't want to talk about it, but really need the help. There's a huge need out here. But also, fast forward, in the present state, we've shifted our business a little bit. Same principles as far as credit, but we realize there's a lot of people out here who are doing it the wrong way. A lot of people out here who are 
just taking people's money, you know, not really putting in the, the, the passion to really help others and not communicating properly. And I study communication, I teach communication. So for me to overly communicate is important because people um, are already scared, right? Mm -hmm. Identity theft is rampant all over the, 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 the world, still the number one crime in the world. And so if you're not gonna be transparent and communicate with people, um, people are gonna be freaked out. And so we've kind of made that the, 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 the foundation of our practice. Um, we teach people all the time. You can you can pray your own prayer. If, you, if you're willing to put in the work, if you're willing to learn the information and you, and you have the discipline, you can do it. But if you're like me, I don't like cutting my own grass. I mean, I I, I hire someone to do it. Not because I can't cut my own grass, because it's I prefer paying somebody to do right. it. You know what I mean? So there's people out here who feel the same way about the credit. So this it, it just becomes a, a huge space of opportunity. And I just want to be clear for people out there because they ask me all kind of crazy questions you do not need to be in the same location as no. someone to help them. absolutely not you absolutely do not I'm, believe it or not i'm, I'm in wisconsin I'm from wisconsin and yes there are black people in wisconsin people and um most i have i would say 75 percent of my client base is outside of the state so i work so, with people all over the country how much do you charge to help somebody repair their credit and i have I, I have a few different options, right? It varies. Uh, and uh, if you go to my, my, my page, I have a link where you can actually go over all the different options. But there's four options, really. First option is called Pinnacle. And that's where, that's a commitment where I'm working with you for, uh, a, so it's really like a relationship. Me and you are working together for a year on your credit. And the whole goal is not only to get all the derogatory marks removed, and any derogatory, anything that's bringing your score down as derogatory has the potential to get removed. So we're talking about collections, um, charge-offs, medical bills, repos, anything, right? Um, and that's a commitment for a year. So even though I tell everyone you want to be committed to the process for four to six months for maximum results, there's a possibility that you might have something pop on your credit report on eighth on the eighth month, right? Well, this year commitment allows me to be able to work on that regardless. So anything that happens between once we get started in a year, you got me locked in as your credit guy, right? I tell people all the time, you know, I want... I I almost want there to be a little bit of jealousy between me and your mate because we talk that much, right? I want you to be so locked in on your credit that you get excited about it, okay? And so that's and that's option one. That's sixteen hundred. You can make that. That's not bad. Not bad at all. You can make that a one-time payment. You can split it up into two payments or even four payments depending on finances, okay? Uh, the second option is, you know, because of you, prices might go up just because of cherry. So blame cherry later. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm trying to get y'all to hook up. Don't worry. Like a coupon code. You know, Cherry J75, would you like 10% off or something? Uh, no, I'm, jo I'm joking. But chair, option two is for somebody. Also, so I'm looking back to option one. Again, option one is about a relationship. Option one is a commitment between me and you. Option two is my commitment to you. That's for somebody who's really not about all that rah rah. They don't want to talk. They don't really want a whole lot of coaching. They're just like, fam, I got these things on my credit report. Could you please get these things off my credit report? That's a six month commitment for me to do everything on my part to get those things off your credit report. That's for somebody who don't want to talk, really. That's uh, $900, and you can split it up into two payments or three payments, OK? okay? The third option is just uh, I sell a, a do-it-yourself kit where I show you everything I've learned, and I provide the, the, the strategies that I've used. Uh, that's uh, $249, one-time payment. And um, the last option is uh, something I just added where I can just focus on late payments and your uh, hard inquiries. Um, and that's uh, $300. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So you can get late payments removed? You're not removing late payments. What you're doing is you're re reversing them, right? You're reversing them from, from late to on time. How do you do that? How do you do that? You got to just <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm just playing. You got to dispute. I mean, listen, all this is, guys, I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm one of those kind of people where I don't hold anything. Like, all this information is something, if you really want to do the work and you want to watch, go to YouTube University, there's a billion people out here making videos on it. There's books out there. I never want to make you feel like this is magic. In fact, I tell everybody, this is not magic, all right? It's a process. Everything is a process, right? Everything is cause and effect. And what, what we have here is in 1971, there was a law put in place called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And that law was created uh, to protect the consumer because it's just checks and balances, right? You have the uh, credit bureaus, they have, have the Fair Debt Collection Act that they have to follow. And then we have the Fair Credit Reporting Act that gives us our rights. And so the reason they did this is because creditors, credit bureaus, as credit bureaus are million dollar companies, they're not federal agencies. They're getting paid billions of dollars every single year to report information. 
and they're, and they're going to be lobbied by the creditors. And so oftentimes their goal is just to put information on your credit report. They don't care one way or another. And why they put stuff on your credit report? Because they know that if it's on your credit report, you're going to freak out. You're going to contact the individual collection agency. You're going to make a payment. And we'll talk about what collection agencies really are shortly. But they're billion-dollar companies. And so what the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act allows you to do is to look at your credit report, and I want you to take away the, the I did this, or it's my theory. Take, let's move that belief system out the the equation. The, I, this is mine, or I did this. I want you to look at your credit report uh, from a business perspective. Let's say, okay, there's checks and balances here, and their job is to report 100% accurate information. If it's not 100% accurate, by law, it has to be removed off your credit report. And so credit repair is just for us challenging them to prove that what they're reporting is 100% accurate. What do I mean by 100% accurate? Is your name 100% accurate on every report? Are the account numbers 100% accurate? Is the amounts they're saying that are owed 100% accurate? Are they saying that, you owe, that you're late on a collection account when that's not possible because the collection account is not a current account, it's not even a credit account. How can you be late on a collection account? You know what I'm saying? All these things provide reasons why things can be removed off your credit report. And there's so many, there's a hundred others of things. Four out of five, four out of five, I don't care what your credit score is, credit report has errors on it. And so our job is just to go in and identify those errors. I love that. So I have so many questions about collections, but before we get to collections, my nine-year-old has another question. She wants to know how old do you have to be to establish credit? Great question. So uh, 18 years old is when they, they start actually making it official, right? But, and I'm pretty sure uh, your mom is probably already doing this, is she can actually put your name on her credit cards now as, as a authorized user. Mm -hmm. And doing so, and teaching you, of course, because you can do that, lots of people do that for their kids, but there's no education behind it. So then once they turn 18, they just botch it anyway, right? But what you want to do is you want to, your mom wants to educate you on credit while adding you as an authorized user. And so that by the time you turn 18, when, when they hit the credit button, month two probably, right after your birthday, you're already at a 700 credit score. Pending, your mom is already there as well, right? So that's just a great way to start. And then at that point, you have to start exercising discipline. Um, I tell, you know, if, if you're going to go to college, what happened to you? Cherry happened to probably 90% of all, you know, people in the college, right? That's where they get us. It. It's predatory, real talk. And it's designed that way, absolutely, to get you started in the game and, and debt, right? So... Education, but yeah, ask your question, 18 Eight, years old. 18 years old. So at 18 years old, one of the things that I ran across was no credit. And people kept telling me, bad credit is better than no credit. And I'm like, but how can I get bad credit when you won't even give me credit? So I had to go do like the little jewelry store credit. I think um, I opened up an account of jewelry store for like $390. I bought my godson some earrings or something and was paying that off. And after... I did that. I was able to establish credit. Why is bad credit? So look, you guys have bad credit. Don't be scared. Why is bad credit better than no credit? Honestly, that's kind of a, I don't want to say it's a fallacy. There's some truth to that, but it, it really depends on the perspective of, of who's looking at your credit report, right? So for example, if I am a real estate company, I don't necessarily I really think that no credit is better than bad credit. I probably prefer no credit. Really? Because at that point, I'm, I can base my decision based on the individual, their income, maybe a few references, and I can say, okay, well, they don't have bad credit. They don't have, I don't have anything to go off of that they're not doing the right thing. So let's give them a shot, right? Versus if I see bad credit, I see negative items here, collections here, no payouts here. It, it makes the decision a lot easier for somebody in real estate, right? <laughs> Now, if you take that same premise for someone who's selling cars, the dealership, again, no credit. It's like, like um, that, that's going to hurt you because there's no proof of you being able to pay a car note. There's no proof of you being able to pay any type of responsible credit. And so having bad credit, um, I can say, okay, I can look at your history and say, okay, well, yeah, you had a, a maybe a downfall over here, but I do show that you had a car note at one time. Or I do show that you were paying on this, get it now for three years or or you know, or, or you know, buy here, pay here, whatever. Um, so it just depends on who's looking at your credit report, really. Okay. okay. So I got a question from TJ. He's in Greensville, Texas, and he asked, "Can you please explain the key factors that influence your credit score?" Absolutely. There's, there's five of them. 
The first one uh, is the most important, is payment history. And the payment history is 35% of your credit score, right? So that means that if you have a credit card or you're paying on a card note mm -hmm. and you have, I don't care if you have a 720 score. I, I have a client right now who had a, he literally was talking about divorcing his wife, okay? Because they have great credit and she forgot to make a payment. And they went from a 780 to a 520 off one late payment, okay? Mm -hmm. He literally, serious. I had to be like, fam, chill out. Like, you can't. He's like, man, I, I'm thinking about it. I, he was really pissed off about this. So late payments are 35% of your score, right? 35%. So you want to stay on top of those payments. Well, even with credit card payments, I don't necessarily advocate minimum payments. But if that's all you can do, make the minimum payment. You know what I mean? Don't don't let it go past that, that time frame. So that's 35% of your score. The next is 30%. That's going to be utilization, right? So if you have have a credit card and you have a thousand dollar limit on that credit card you really don't want to um allow the balance to go over a hundred dollars past a statement due date not the billing due date okay. the statement due date. wait wait slow down for me a hundred dollars over the statement due date. right so what i'm saying is, what? is that you, you don't want to go over 10 okay. percent utilization okay. you know so we talk about 30 percent. that was the kind of the normal number but we're realizing that 10 percent is really the number because creditors, I mean, credit card companies, they want to see that you can handle large amounts of money and manage it properly, right? That's why they want to give you more money. And so if you have a $1,000, because people say, well, you mean I can't use over $1,000? No, you can't use over $1,000 if you don't have discipline. The key is not that you can't use over, I mean, not over 1000 You can't use over $100 if you don't have discipline. But the, the matter is really, no matter what you spend, by the time the statement due date is, is due, you need to bring that balance at a hundred dollars or below or 10% below utilization. Okay. So an example would be if you bought your laptop at $700 um, and your statement due date is on the 29th, you need to make sure you pay that down to below a hundred dollars before the 29th. Okay. So, Thank you. right. Now, another way you could do that is if you don't have, if you feel like you don't have discipline, then you're on a thousand dollar car limit. Your real limit is what? A hundred dollars. Right? <laughs> You don't go past $100 no matter what's going on because you know you're not going to be able right. to pay it back. And if you do that for six months, credit bureaus and the credit card companies are going to communicate and say, okay, we got somebody who's really responsible. And I'll tell you another uh, hack of how you can boost your score really fast with credit cards a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, utilization is a big deal. You got to have the so, utilization, okay? You just said Milo. He already said he's going to get to your question. We got Milo in Tennessee, and that was his question. So he's oh, really? going to the question in a little while, Milo, okay? I got you. I got you. Uh, and so the third way uh, to build your credit, guys, you want to have a good mix of credit, right? A balance between installment loans and, and revolving credit. Installment loans are your car notes, your mortgage payments, right? Um, nowadays, you can actually use your rent to build your credit. There's so many different ways to go about that. Um, you know, so many different ways you can actually, as long as you're making your, your rent payments electronically, there's so many companies now that's willing to take that rent payment every month and report it on your credit report. And if you've been with the same a real estate company for over two years, they can even go back two years and apply two years of history onto your credit report. A lot of mortgage companies now are going to be using in 2024, using that as an indicator to help get you approved. So you, if you are renting right now, you can have the you can get the same credit that someone who's paying a mortgage is paying. Because think about it, that's most likely your biggest bill. Why not get credit for it every month, right? So, uh, installment loans are are something that you pay every month towards a goal, right? Towards a balance, right? Revolving credit is something you pay uh, every month, and once you pay it off, you get the money back. It, re, it, re, it resurfaces, right? So, credit cards are revolving credit, car notes, mortgage loans. Installment loans are installment. Now, if you don't have mortgage, you don't have a car note, a lot of times you can go to a credit union or even some banks and get a credit builder loan. And that, maybe federal does it. And it is basically where they, they look at your credit and they say, okay, we're going to give you a $500 right now, but you can't have it. It's locked into a savings account. And what you're going to do is you're going to pay us back 25 to 45 bucks a month every month on time. If you do that for a year, we'll give you that $500 plus a little bit of interest and in every payment and reports onto your credit. So that's just a way where you can build your credit with an installment loan, all right? So we talked about, so far we talked about the payment history, utilization, and a mixture of credit. The next thing you want to look at is payment, is, is your actual length of credit. Mm. That's about 10% of your score. 
All right. So if you, I tell people all the time, people say, well, I can't use this credit card anymore. I'm just going to cut it up. Don't do that. Do not close. Or you can cut it up, but don't close it. Cut it up is one thing. Do not close the account. If you had a credit card for two years and you cut it up just because you weren't disciplined, you just, you just killed two years of history that is building your score. Two years of history, it's like a relationship. Imagine being dated somebody and you get, you know, upset at them and you decide to cancel off two years of that history, right? You know, now, now, you're, now you're brand new. You don't know this person anymore, right? right? Same thing with credit. So your best bet is just to, you know, pay it down and cut it up or hide it somewhere. And, you know, use it once a month or something like that. I, but don't I, cut I, it up because you, if you close the account, your score is going to drop dramatically and that history is gone. So... Because I hide mine from myself often. <laughs> or I'll put you have to one sometimes. away and be like, I'm saving this for Christmas. So I don't touch it until Christmas. You're smart, smart, smart woman. So, right? and so go ahead. One of the things that I do for my kid now is like, she's got her name on this little credit card. And I just buy like socks or pajamas or something that I know that I have the cash for. And I will literally like charge it, wait like five days and then pay it off is that helping her in any way um is the card in her mm -hmm. name or oh, sure, your card well yeah i mean well let me tell you it's my card but it's your card but her name yeah so it is helping her but what's really helping her and i'm gonna have to get to it because you actually had alluded to one of the ways you can boost your credit really fast i'm gonna need a game but i'm gonna talk about the last way to um that reflects your credit score we talked about four the very last one is inquiries mm -hmm. right the least inquiry Inquiries we have the better. Uh, we just had a client that came in and had over 132 inquiries on her credit report. And it's, it's lack of knowledge. She thought, basically, that if the more she pressed, the eventually they would say yes, right? <laughs> so apparently we know that's not the truth, right? Um, Baby so, girl. Yeah, right. So you want to have a minimum of, you know, a maximum rather of four or five maximum, right? Anything above that, they think that you're thirsty, yeah. right? Girls, if you ever dated somebody that was thirsty, you already know. That's that's not a good look, right? Guys, you already know. You're like, uh, you're a little too eager, fam. <laughs> I'm going to need you to take a break. Same thing with creditors, right? They're looking like, nah, you didn't apply it all week. And, and um, let me say this, though. Sometimes it's not that you're thirsty. Sometimes it's that you're being preyed upon. A lot of people go to a, a car dealership, right? Yes. Car dealership hits you 27 times in one day. You told them you only won it one time. They still hit you with 27. They're shopping your deal around. Yeah. So another pro tip is if you can avoid those dealerships, go to a credit union, get approved for the loan. They'll cut a check for the amount of the car or the, the wire transfer to them. And it's just one inquiry. All right. So if you have a local credit union that'll do it for you, I highly recommend doing that. All uh, right. That brings me to a question and I hate to cut you off, but I watch like Instagram all the time, right? I'm one of those people who might be slightly addicted need to get off, but you hear all these like how to build your credit, how to do this, how to do that. I actually saw somebody say, well, what you need to do is have all the applications open at once and hit them at the same time. So they're talking about if you're on your website, if you're on, a, if you're on your computer. Yeah. And a lot of times they'll say they're going to uh, incognito on your computer and Open up, open up the incognito browser, have all the applications, and then hit it at once. I mean, in theory, yes, you can do it that way. I, I kind of dwell in the world of who's going to really do all that. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of the world I dwell in. The average person is not probably going to take the time to do all of that. So that's good information to know. And the reason why they say that is because there, there's facts to it, but there's, there should be a backstory, right? The backstory is when credit the credit bureaus see that you're applying for a vehicle, there's a little bit of grace because they understand you're applying for a vehicle, okay? But if it's 10 different auto loans, it's still going to be 10 different inquiries. Like, there's no way to get around that part. That's what I was right. wondering. I was like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But what does what you can do is you can, after afterwards, you can potentially dispute it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't get approved for it or it, it was, you know, uh, could you please remove it? And sometimes I do a goodwill removal on that. But really, the best way to do it, if, if I was going to do an upper echelon class on credit, um, is you would find out maybe five or seven dealerships and find out who who are they pulling from, right? Or let's say you find five that are pulling from TransUnion, five that are pulling from Experian, and five that are pulling from Equifax, and then or even with credit cards, and then apply for them all at once. 
Well, now because it's it's only it's really it's really three dealerships only, and and they're all pulling from the same credit bureau. So it's not it's not as many hits as what I'm trying to say because you've identified that this one's only going through TransUnion, this one's only going through Experian, this one's only going through Equifax. So you can minimize how many inquiries you're getting because you're strategically applying for for these with um, companies that you've researched who they they pull from. Again, it's a great play. If you're really, you have to really be, uh, okay, I'll give you an example. You are a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. yes? yes? So you know more than I know about nutrition, most likely, right? The stuff you know, most people, if they don't know it, and even if they do know it, won't apply it because it's not uh, something that they're 100% bought, bought into, right. right? Whereas for you, you bought into it. So it's, it's common sense to you. Same thing with credit. If someone's not really all in, like really about credit life, really trying to become an expert in credit, that, that information kind of goes over there. It's great for views. It's great for clicks. But the average person is not really going to apply that stuff. I try to teach things that people, I believe people can actually mentally digest and do. Like, for, for example, um, the gentleman asked about building your credit. Yeah. Here's a, a, a quick credit hack that everybody can do. If you have a credit card or a secure credit card, <clears throat> let's just start with a secure credit card. A secure credit card, guys, is a card that um, um, you put the money up for because your credit, you're building your credit, and you want to be able to, to show the credit bureaus and you want to show the credit card companies that you're responsible. And so let's say you got $1,000. This is a great plan if you get your taxes coming up. Take $1,000, $1,500 or even more and put it on a secure credit card. Maybe Federal offers them, Capital One offers them. Um, just find a good one. So maybe your credit union offers one. Then go to your bills that you're currently paying. We'll say electric. What are some bills, Cherry, that people pay? Gas, light, water. Right. All of these except debit or credit cards, right? Add them all up because you're going to pay those every month anyway. And moving forward, do not use your debit card to pay those bills. Use the credit card. Then use the cash that you would normally use to pay those bills to pay off the credit card every month by the saving due date. So what you're doing is you're showing the credit card companies that you can manage large amounts of money because the goal is for those bills to equal up almost close to that credit limit. So let's say it's a thousand dollars. If you if you use a thousand dollars every month paying bills and then pay it off by the statement due date every month on time, the credit card company like, oh wow, we got a we got a winner here. This person knows how to use the money and they pay it off every time on time. What will happen is you do that for six months, your scores will probably jump up between uh, 75 to 150 points, and the credit card companies are going to start shooting you offers left and right. And the whole goal with that is not so that you can become irresponsible, so that you can start off at a thousand. Now you get a credit card for five thousand. Do the same thing with that. Now you're going to get a card, credit card for ten thousand, or maybe fifteen thousand. Now in a, in six months to a year, you've just increased your buying power to twenty thousand dollars. Right now you can leverage that to to invest. You can leverage that to do other things, but you're still going to keep the same principle. You're not going to be, you're not going to be um, irresponsible with the credit cards. You're going to use the credit cards to leverage to build your business portfolio. Then, if you just want to start a business, we can talk about building your business credit. And it is just a whole world of options. But you have to start off by deciding that you want to be disciplined in the credit game. I love the fact that you brought up taxes because I have some homegirls. Well, they used to be my home, not my friends anymore. But every tax season. They was buying a new bedroom suit or they was buying some new living room furniture and they didn't need it because they already had it, but they called themselves updating. And I know the tax season is around the corner. So before you buy that car, before you go buy a new bedroom suit, before you buy a new living room suit, fix your credit. Fix your um, credit. Yeah. And don't, uh, I have and don't, I'm sorry, real quick, I didn't mean to cut you off because I know you're a boss. I don't want to get cut off here. But, um, don't use your tax money and give it to the collection agency. It's like that's do not, absolutely do not give your money to the collection agencies. Do not give your money to charge offs. And this is why. So, what is the collection company? Let's let's, let's break that down first. What is the collection company? The collection company is a billion dollar company mm -hmm. that buys debt for for the low, just like I used to buy I used to sell drugs. I used to buy work for the low, right? And then they sell it right. for profit, right? That's what collection agencies do. So what they do is let's just say you know somebody who has a, um, a T-Mobile bill. And for some reason, they switched to AT&T. And they had a balance of $300, right? So that balance $300, I 
after four months, because they're not paying it, because they with AT&T, they're like, oh, I'm good, it goes into a charge-off status. A charge-off status means that the original creditor, T-Mobile, knows they're not getting their money, and they've written this as a loss on their taxes. It's a write-off. They charge it off. Once they do that, they no longer can collect on that debt because they've written it off as a loss, and it's a loss. You can't, it can't be a loss and a profit, right? So it's a loss. They move on into a charge-off status. Now, collection companies, they go and they find debt that is charged off, and they offer to purchase the debt for pennies on a dollar. So for that same debt was $300, the collection agency might offer um, T-Mobile $30 for that debt. T-Mobile's like, cool, I'll take it, whatever. Now they have, when they purchase that debt, what they do is they have nothing but information. They have a name, they have some phone numbers, they have some addresses, they have a balance. And there's no facts, there's no proof that the debt they purchase is actually the person that they say it is. There's just zero way to prove that unless they have a signed document, which most likely they don't have. And so what happens is the collection agency said, okay, we got this name, Cherry, and got her number, let's give her a call. So the whole goal here is for me to get Cherry to pay as close to $300 as possible so I can make a profit off this $30 purchase. Every time the collection, uh, the collector does that, they get about 35 to 45% commission, right? So is the collector wrong for doing his job or her job? No, they're doing their job, right? But it's still a play, it's a business. And so I call up Cherry. I say, hey, Cherry, this is Jay from uh, ABC Collection Agency. I'm calling about that T-Mobile bill you have for $300. Just wanted to find out if we can get this settled. And Cherry's like, oh my God, yeah. And we're like, yeah, because, you know, and they might say little suggestive things because nowadays they can't be as aggressive. But they may say, so, yeah, you know, this is really not a good thing to have this debt. We definitely don't want to, move forward into further collection and contact attorneys or worse yet hit your, your taxes. So it's probably a good idea we get this squared away. And so Cherry's like, oh my God, I don't how much to do that. How much do I gotta pay? And they say, well it's three hundred dollars. Um if you can split that up into maybe two payments, we can get this squared away. So Cherry pays the three hundred dollars to a collection agency. She's thinking she's good. That's our credit report. It does show that it was paid, but my score didn't go up at all. Mm -mm. It's, it's still, still on there my credit report as a collection agency it's just on my credit report as a paid collection mine was wireless in the 90s uh what was that again i said in the 90s mine was to verizon right, wireless right, right, exactly exactly <laughs> and so what happens is that you pay this money to a collection agency it doesn't come off your credit yeah. report and a collection account is, is is just as bad if it's a zero balance as a 300 dollars balance because the credit bureaus don't care about the balances of collection accounts they're di they're dinging you because you have a collection account, not because of the amount. Mm -hmm. So you can have a collection account for five dollars. It hurts you the same way as five thousand dollars. Really? Yes, with collection accounts. With collection accounts, it's not the amount that's hurting you. It's that it's a collection account. The audacity. Yes. <laughs> yes. It has no bearing on your the, the amount of a collection account has no bearing on your credit score. So you said do not pay a collection account for not, no reason. Can a collection agency sue you? Collection agencies can't sue you. They, they, they purchase the debt. And this is where kind of that gray area comes in. That's why you have to use your own judgment. I talk to you all the time. I, I'm not you. I'm not your, your personal business. So you do what's best for you. Okay. But when a collection agency sues, they can, they, can, they can put a judgment on if they really want to. They can do all that stuff. But generally speaking, once it gets removed off your credit report, they can't do anything. It's, off, it, they're not, it's not reported anymore. And so I tell people, if you're going to pay it, all the time you should pay it is if they have proven to you that they're either going to, they're garnishing in some way. If, if you can avoid a garnishment, of course, pay it, right? Or if they, oh, well, what's the second reason? If they, um, if they decide that, let's say, for example, I, when I was 18, I got into a car accident and I hit a, a city light pole. The city light pole was $10,000. I didn't have $10,000. So they, the, so it, it, after four months, it became a charge off and it became a collection account and they put it on my credit. I didn't have $10,000 to pay this collection agency, right? So in that situation, I had to make, I filed bankruptcy to get that collection off my credit report so I can get my license, right? These are all the extreme cases why, you know, collections can hurt. But for them, for 99.99% of the people, that's not the case. These are just regular bills, medical bills, old cell phone bills, maybe an old utility bill. That didn't that didn't get paid. It went into charge off, and now it's a collection account. And if you pay that, you're just giving your money away because you never did business with 
those collection companies. Mm -hmm. They purchased the debt. They just like, it'd be no different if I owe Cherry some money. Cherry didn't get the money. Cherry had that punky like punky, punky like I'm selling the debt. I mean, Cherry like I'm selling the debt. Punky like you know what? I'm, I'm in the debt collection business. I'm buying the debt. She's like, well, Jebecca owe me a thousand dollars. She's like, well, I'll give you uh, how much you selling? I'll give you two hundred. So Cherry sells the debt to Punky for two hundred. All of a sudden, Punky calling me up like, yo, you owe me a thousand dollars. What am I gonna tell Punky? You ain't got it. I ain't got it. I don't, know, I don't even know you, man. Why are you calling me? <laughs> I never loaned you any money. You see what I'm saying? Same scenario. So, yes, that same money that you could be using, that you're giving to class agents, you could be using that to repair your credit. That's that's the, the point of the matter. So don't give your money away. Don't give your money. Now, can they come after your assets? I heard you say garnishing things, right? Can credit companies come after your home? Anybody, you can come after. Anybody can put a lien on somebody's property. That's not a credit collection thing. That's a law thing, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter who you are. If, if somebody wants to push it to the issue, they can do that. So I'm never going to lie and say that that can't happen. That's anybody you owe money to. If you owe, if I owe you money, you can go put a, a lien on my house. You can put, you know what I'm saying? That's just the law. Anybody can do that. If they have the paperwork, right? But you don't want to let that fear, because that's what they're using it as fear, mm -hmm. to force you to pay something you don't need to pay. You know what I mean? So it's like, because that, that's what they do. They use those tactics. They send these letters and they call and they do these intimidating words like that. And people freak out. And they just give the money away. Now, I did hear that you can ask the collector to give you proof of an original contract. And if they can't prove the original contract, they have to like. Right. And, and see, when we say have to, that's a, right. The law is, is, is put in place that people have to follow it, right? But can we agree that a lot of times people don't follow the law? And that's why credit repair comes into play because sometimes they know it's not, and they still report it, right? And that's why having somebody who is skilled at the, at the FCRA and who knows how to kind of challenge them and force them is a positive. But to your point, yes, um, we, we, that's called validating the debt. And basically, they're supposed to send you proof that, hey, this is you. We got a contract. Would you sign in this contract? Of that, you know, that's, pretty, that's the proof we're talking about. It has to be a signed contract with your signature. Anything besides that is not proof, by the way. I don't care what they tell you. It's not proof. And guess what? When they purchase the debt, it's rare that they're purchasing that too. Really what they're purchasing is information. They can bluff to you that they got a bunch of details. They don't. They bought, they, they bought names and numbers. It'd be no different if you went online right now. You said you're trying to expand your, your base. You want to you want to purchase email addresses mm -hmm. of people who, who, who are into nutrition. That's essentially what they're doing when they're purchasing debt. Names and numbers. So they, they won't be able to. That's good to know. You're dropping jewels today. So I have a lady, she, her name is Mandy, and she lives in California. She wants to know what method do you use to analyze a client's credit report? Well, here's the thing, because I've looked at so many credit reports, I'm, I, I really can just look at the basic in the very beginning. I can just look at your, if you have credit card, literally, I can just look at how many derogatory marks you have versus your payment history versus your hard inquiries because i know all the five levels mm -hmm. of that report your credit i can i can do a quick scan and tell what's going to happen with your report once i start your credit that's when i actually look at all three reports and decide what's the method i'm going to use to start getting these things removed but guys remember i told you it's not magic it's just a process right it's very simple right if i stop eating sugar-based products mm -hmm. and drink more water what's going to happen <laughs> right I'm going to kind of be hydrated. That's, you said what? I said sugar-based products and water. If I stop drink, if I stop eating so much sugar, oh. increase my water you're, intake, right, and started eating more grains, what's going to happen? You're going to lose, lose some weight. Weight, right? If I remove the derogatory marks off your credit report, what's going to happen? You're going to score going to go. Yeah. Right. If I add more positive positive payment history to your credit report, what's going to happen? The score is going to go up. So it's really just, it's, it's, it's simple to me. I know to some people it's more complicated, but when I look at a report, I can assess very fast. Like I don't use any kind of, you know, paid system or anything like that. I just, I can just look at it and tell. I've looked at it enough to know. So I have people on here asking me, are there any guarantees or promises that you make regarding credit score improvement? And how do we know the difference between a legitimate person who's repairing credit and somebody who's just trying to scam us? Good question. Well, 
because you have the advantage, I mean, everybody should just go through me. That's number one, you know what I mean? Because I'm legit. No, I'm just, but you might not like me. And I tell people all the time, I'm not for everybody, right? You might decide you want to go with somebody. So here's some things you can go with. This is just my personal opinion. Now, because I'm in the industry, I never want to uh, throw shade on people. So I tell people all the time that if someone is knowledgeable of credit repair, you know, and, they're, and they've been doing this for some time, then uh, I'm not going to knock their practices. When I, when I rate my, when I decipher someone who I wouldn't do business with, it's based on how they communicate. That's, that's what I use, okay? Because I'm a communication, I don't want to say guru, but I, I do that. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I have a whole course on raw, authentic communication. And so I, I use communication as the basis of everything. And so if I'm dealing with someone, and that individual, and write these things down, this is just some could tell, tell things. If they tell you, they guarantee that you're going to get an increase by this date. I saw somebody real quickly say, should I file chapter seven? No, I had to answer that real quick. Um, but um, if they guarantee I can get this off in 30 days, 45 days, and it guarantees, run. Because there's no way logically anyone can guarantee anything. Because you're, what you're doing is you're challenging the credit bills. And there's the, what's the, the credit bills might say no on the first round, right? So there's no way to guarantee anything. They're, they're just trying to get your money, number one. So anytime, so do I guarantee? No, I guarantee customer satisfaction. I guarantee results. I guarantee that if we work together for six months or a year, your credit's going to be a heck of a lot better than it was when we started, right? But I'm never going to tell you, oh, yeah, I guarantee you're going to have a 50-point increase by this day because there's no way to know. That's just unethical. There's no way for me to tell you that. Even, even, if, even, if, the, even if 10 out of the 10 last people I've worked with got a 100-point increase in the first 90 days, I'm never still going to tell you that that's going to happen for you. Because guess what happens the minute I tell you that? It don't happen. Yeah. And now I look stupid, and you think I'm a scam artist. So I'm just not going to play that game. So never take guarantees on price, I mean, on, on credit score increase or time frames. That's the first telltale. Not to say they're scamming you, but they're just unethical. They're just they're trying to get the money. Number two thing, this unfortunately, this is going to be something you'll learn after you pay the money. How often do they communicate with you? Because in the beginning, when they're trying to get your money, you're gonna get you know, they're contact you all the time, right? They're trying to communicate with you. They're trying to get in your inbox. They have a conversation with you. They're available. <clears throat> then you give them your money, <clears throat> and it's like, you know, you went on the first bad date, right? Anybody, anybody answer the phone no more? You know what I'm saying? Everybody's busy. You're like, man, you just got real busy real fast. <clears throat> what happened? That's unfortunate because sometimes people, like taxi. Texting you, people are taking a lot of clients in. Yeah. Just taking the money. And then we'll work on it when we work on it. And then, you know, it's just, it's not fair to the person. All right. So that, that was the two things that I just, I, I pay attention to communication. I'll give you an example. I use a lot of examples with Cherry because she's a boss. And for those of you that know, if you're a black man in America, Cherry back growing up was like, oh, yeah. that so I thought I was gonna tell you that. I told my wife I was saying too. Factual. So when I communicated with Cherry, and I've known Cherry off and on for probably what a few years now, right? This first communicated. How she communicates dictates how if I'm gonna do business with her, right? If she's rude, if she's you know, and I understand she's a celebrity, so I understand that she probably gets hit up a lot. So a little, a little uh, being pointed, I, I can respect. Cause it's creeps in her inbox, probably and all types of stuff, right? But she still is respectful. You know what I'm saying? And she, and she, and she, and she well, with me, I, I, I ain't gonna worry about nobody else. I'm with a me. mirror. So Bingo. How they treat me? Right. Yeah. But you, but you see what I'm saying? So you're respectful because you felt respectful by a beer. So it was a, it was a communication. You see what I'm saying? That's communication. So when you're talking to somebody, here's the thing, guys. You don't owe nobody your money. Like there's nobody that call that you owe them your money. And there's too many, too many people out here, respectful ish. <laughs> there's too many people out here that can provide a solution. So I refuse to give my money to somebody who's not going to talk to me and communicate to me in a respectful way. I refuse to give my time to anyone. Forget money, my time to anyone that's not going to treat me a certain way. So you just got to use your gut instinct a lot of times. Like just go with your gut. And some people are going to talk to me and decide they don't want to do business with me. And guess what? That's cool too, because everything's not for everybody, and everybody's not for everybody. There might be a woman out here who's a single mom, who who she buys with my wife better, right? So she, oh, she just 
who wants to work with a woman. Mm -hmm. like just, I'm okay with any of that. My thing is just get solutions. Get solutions. But go with your gut, guys. Oftentimes, if your gut will tell you, the Holy Spirit is dope. It'll tell you, like, nah, this ain't it. Right? <laughs> you got to listen to that. <laughs> I'm not talking about fear. No. Because sometimes we'll let fear dictate, too. I'm talking about yeah. instinct. You know what I'm saying? So. Your gut never lies. When it comes to credit companies, like I heard you mention Credit Karma, which one do you think is <clears throat> for people to go to to monitor their own credit? Really good question. So, first of all, <clears throat> Credit Karma is only the most, it's best, not the best, it's just the most popular, okay. right? They have, they, they paid the most sponsors. They have the most money out in the game right now to scam. And so because of that, they got the most people knowing who they are. Right, and then they've not done that. They've also added a lot of other features to make it easier. Their whole goal is that when you think of credit, you think of them, right? But all apps, it doesn't matter whether it's Credit Karma, Credit Sesame, um, any of these apps that you open up, they're all their 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 model is always looking at a Vantage three point oh score. Vantage three point oh. So there's almost just two major scoring models. There's FICO and there's Vantage three point oh. Mortgage companies use FICO, right? Most lenders use FICO. But there's credit card companies and even some dealerships that go off Vantage 3.0, mostly credit card companies. So because credit card companies use Vantage 3.0 most, those apps, they have partnerships with credit card companies. You think about it, if you go to any app, Experian app, Credit Karma app, Credit Sesame, there's always see your credit card offers below. That's mm -hmm. because they have partnerships with them. And they're able to see off your Vantage 3.0 if, you, if you, they can get you approved or not get you approved. And so Vantage 3.0 is what you're looking at when you open up Credit Karma and you see your score. It says TransUnion is a 578 and your Equifax is a 676. And you're like, what's the difference? And then you go to the dealership and they're like, nah, fam, you're like, <laughs> you're like 502. You're like, well, what, what happened? That's because it's not that Credit Karma is not accurate. Mm -hmm. It's just a different scoring model. FICO heavily weights their score based on the amount of debt you have, whereas Credit Karma or Vantage 3.0 doesn't factor that into the equation. And so this is where that difference between the credit scores come in. So if you're excited, you got a 700 on your Credit Karma, I'm not saying don't be excited, but you might want to go to your, download the Experian app, pay the little extra money, and look at all three credit scores from a FICO perspective and see what your score is. And if you see it's dope, then you, you're in there. I would Experian say, is the only one that uses FICO. I would say once a year, you're able to go to Experian, right, and pull your credit report for free, aren't well, you? It's, no, once a year, you may go to all three credit bureaus and get a free credit report through annualcreditreport.com, annualcreditreport.com. Um, the Experian app lets you see their credit score anytime. If you do the Experian app, you can, you can see the Experian credit score anytime. But if you want to see the other two, you have to pay for the membership. It's like 27 bucks a month. But I think it's a good investment if you're like really on top of your credit because it gives you FICO scores and it lets you see what's really going on with your credit from a mortgage perspective, from a lender perspective. Again, a lot of people don't like Credit Karma. I used to say stay away from Credit Karma. Credit Karma, is not, I used to say it was, it was inaccurate. That's not true. It's not that it's inaccurate. It's just a different scoring model. It's just different. I, I see somebody on here saying, I pay my credit card off before the due date. Why is my credit score not increasing? This is, a, this is, a, this is going to blow you guys' mind. I, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, Hope, you're right. They are, I think they're, they're actually still doing, I think they're still doing um, free credit reports every week, annualcreditreport.com. Ever since um, the pandemic, they've been doing that. Um, but to answer your question, so there's a bill, there's their billing due date on your credit report. Everybody has credit cards, pay attention. There's your billing due date, and then there's your statement due date. Logically, we always think, and I, th I really think it's trickery personally. We think, well, the bill's due on the 25th, mm -hmm. right? Or let's say 27th, right? But the statement date is the 25th, right? And so what happens is, we think we're supposed to pay everything by the bill and due date. We're paying it by the bill and due date, nothing's happening. That's because that's not the date we're supposed to pay it off. <laughs> it's the statement due date. When is the statement post? When is the statement update? That's the date we should be going by. So if you're going to pay your bill, make sure you're paying it 
before, a day, like a day before the statement due date. And then it's going to report on time, and then you're going to get credit for it. Now, I was taught, I have a white uncle who I'm so thankful for because he knows more about money than the black side of my family knows about money. And he taught me to pay my credit cards twice a month instead of one. Right, it's called the um, two, 214 rule, I believe it is. But basically, yeah. And so what happens is you pay it uh, the beginning of the billing cycle and then the middle of the billing cycle, right? And it, it counts as two payments. And it literally um, reports as two payments. Some credit card companies don't honor, but most do. And it's a quick way to boost your score as well. So that was one of the questions that I had from Milo. He wants to know what is the fastest way to raise your credit score? Shouts out to Milo in Tennessee. Um, um, shout out Milo. And yes, um, those two things, you can do that mm -hmm. method. Uh, the the pay making two payments in one month before the statement due date. Uh, preferably, they say you can do it in the middle of the month and then right before the end of the statement due date. Or and I won't say or I'll say and uh, what I told you before about earlier taking that credit card, using it uh, to pay your bills and using your cash to pay off the credit cards and paying it off every time. Okay, so I have another question that came in from Forney, Texas. Texas is heavy with us this morning. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Texas? <laughs> they want to know. How do you stay up to date on credit law? You know what? Once you're in the loop, mm -hmm. um, you'll know. Yes, I have heard of the snowball effect, by the way. Uh, but once you're in the loop, um, you can, you kind of just you're, see. It's like um, I tell people all the time when you start a business. If you're not obsessed in the business, it's hard press. That's why I'm a Kobe fan. I'm a fan of anyone who has who's obsessed in what they do, because obsession will force you to stay in the know. You're going to watch the videos. You're going to get the updates. Your algorithm is going to pop on stuff on your credit. You're going to be, you're going to know what's going on. So to answer your question, you just got to be obsessed with credit and you're going to, and once you're obsessed with credit, you're going to be uh, getting updates. Like for example, last year, I got a, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't even remember where I got the update from. Uh, I think it was a news article that came in, but it was telling me how um, in 2023 going to 2024, any medical bills over $500 legally are not able to be posted on your credit report, legally. So you got a medical bill over $500 per the updates of the credit, Fair Credit Reporting Act, it cannot post on your credit report. It has to be removed. Anything under $500, they can, they can do it. So a lot of people didn't know that, but I had got a kind of a, just an update about the credit, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, but I don't honestly know where it came from. I'm just so, you know what I'm saying? I'm so obsessed. Then when the information came in, I took it around with it. So I just say that once you become obsessed about credit and you're watching the videos, you're, 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 you're reading the news articles, you're constantly doing it, you're going to start to get, get the information just fed to you. In 2024, that's just how it happens. Someone just asked, does credit consolidation actually help or harm you? Now, the 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 short answer is absolutely not. It does. Listen, I hate credit consolidation. I think credit consolidation is absolutely the devil. And let me tell you why. So I own a credit consolidation company. And I say, hey, let's take all of your debts on your credit report and let's consolidate them together and then make a small payment every month and then I'll manage that and I'll pay it off every month. And as they get paid off, it's going to build your credit. How many of you, by a show of hearts, how many of you have ever done credit consolidation? And then after a year, you lose your credit report, and it looked worse than it did when you started the credit consolidation. Oh. By showing hearts or emojis or whatever, and then I want you to let me know. Because, guys, the reason why that is, is because imagine me coming to you and telling you, let me, just give me, you know, $400 a month. And I'm going to take that, I'm going to divide it up to all the collection agencies. Remember what collection agencies are. Collection agencies aren't even, you shouldn't even be paying those off. What about charge-offs? Charge off should not even be paid off. They're, they're written off as a loss. So I'm giving these companies money and none of it I'm getting credit for. I'm getting credit for none of it. And they're just taking my money. And they're saying, you're going to be debt free. Hoorah, you're going to be debt free. Congratulations. And then after a year, I look at my credit report and it's worse than it was before. And on top of that, um, because they also took some of my credit cards and said they're going to consolidate them. What do they do with those? They call the credit card company, they close the accounts, which we don't want to do. Yeah. And then they start making payments on them minimum payments, but guess what you're getting now? You're getting an, 
astronomical amount of late payments on your credit report. So you just racked up about 12 to 13 new late payments. Nothing's happening to these collections of charge-offs. All in, all in the, um, the, the desire to be debt-free, debt-free, right? It's, it's the biggest hustle. It's a great hustle. It's a hustle, but it's absolutely not beneficial. The only way, the only way it's, it's beneficial is if they actually do uh, a debt refinance audition where you get approved and they take a loan and they pay off all of your debts. But even then, we're not paying off collections of charge off. We're paying people off credit cards, but not collections of charge offs. And then you can make one payment to pay off the credit cards. The credit cards are still active, so we didn't close them. We just brought the balances down to zero, which by default is going to boost your score because now the utilization is low. And we're just paying that off. That's the only way it's beneficial. But all that other stuff, guys, it's a hustle, it's a scam, and I highly, highly advise you, run away, run away. Right, so the, one of the other questions that came in that I really want to ask you, because it's a little personal to me, is I was told to worry about my big debt, right? Like if I have a credit card and the debt on that credit card is $600, worry about paying that off before I pay off the credit card debt that's $400 because of the interest. But the way my brain works is, it's easier for me to pay off the little one before I pay off the big one. Is that right. wrong with thinking? No, it's not. I mean, I think somebody, have, I'm actually scrolling to see, I think somebody asked about that snowballing. Yeah. Right. And that's what snowballing is. So when it comes to credit, guys, a lot of it is, is going to be based on what works best for you. We're, in my communication course, I teach people this magic question. And if you can remember, it would be great. The question is, what is the end result you're looking to accomplish with every action you're taking? Right? What is the end result you're looking to accomplish? So when I communicate, when I speak, I don't speak unless I ask that question quickly in my head so that whatever I'm saying is effective or whatever I'm doing is effective. Same thing with paying those credit cards off. What's the end result you're looking to accomplish, Trey? With what you're doing, what's the end result you were looking to accomplish? I was just looking to eliminate one so that I can focus on the big one. So no matter which option you do, whichever one works best for you is the one you do, right? That's the one you do. Whichever one is the best one, whichever one you're going to stick to, that's the one you do. Forget about, you know, what's, forget about whether or not you're paying more interest or less interest. That's true, and that's something we should be worried about. But if your brain says this is this works and you're getting results, do it. You get what I'm saying? Because what happens is sometimes we'll we'll be so um, paralyzed by which is the right way we won't do anything at all, and that's the worst thing that happens. You see what I'm saying? But to ask you, so the snowball effect is basically you take your debts and you start off with the smallest one first. You pay it off because think about it. If you have five credit cards, one's 300, one's 700, one's 1500, one's 5000. And let's say they're all above 50% utilization, right? So they're all halfway maxed out. What do you think the average person, and also remember this, people, Human beings, we thrive off progress. We thrive off progress. We like to progress. Yeah. That's all human beings. You want to see somebody who's depressed because they don't feel like they're progressing in life. They feel like they're digressing in life, right? And so when you pay off that small credit card, how do you feel? Oh, I feel, you feel like, wonderful. Like, yeah. There's one less thing I have to worry about. Right, done. Okay. So now you move on to the next thing. That's the snowball effect. If it works for you, do it. Some people are like different. They're like, they, they see a big day and they feel like they got to tackle that first. Like, they, that's their mindset. They feel like they have to do that. So guess what? That's what works for you. Okay, well, knock that big one out. And once you do that, you're going to feel amazing. Then go to the next one. It's about what works best for you. One of the biggest things I learned, guys, I have over um, 24 years in sales, 20 plus years of sales training. And I used to be one of those people that ran to the gurus, right? I just watch every guru. And I'm not going to name them because they're all good people. But I used to run to the gurus, you know, how to sell, how to, all this stuff. And I realized in my 40s that, and it's not knocking anyone who does this, I realized that most of the stuff that they were selling was because they were trying to make money. Flash, newsflash, right? right? Newsflash. It wasn't that it was necessarily the right, right move. It was the right move to allow you to purchase something for me. That's really what it was. There is no number one salesperson. There is no number one book. There is no number one method of getting rich. There's no number one real estate professional. There's no number one. There's no number one credit person. Mm -hmm. There's only the one you vibe with. That's honest, ethical, and providing results. Well, right? And so... 
if you, but I'm scared that they're about to cut us off soon because we actually have a time limit. Uh, uh, too bad, man. Well, I don't want to hold you guys up. Uh, I appreciate you, first of all, having me on. I mean, I really do. Uh, hopefully we can do this a 